You are listening to a Rome cast with Neil Kramer. Yes, the daffodils, and the tulips, and the swamp lanterns, and the trillium have risen from the soil. The birds sing. The cherry blossoms bloom, and 18,000 grey whales pass by this Pacific coastline as they head north to the Chukchi Seas near Alaska. The light shines on us all, and we know that spring has returned. Today is a good day for envisioning the time ahead. The best occasion to think of the future is when the sun is up, particularly around the noon hour or in the early afternoon. At night, it is often wise to cast one's consciousness only upon the immediacy of one's surroundings and the physicality of presence. To be grounded in the room, open, warm, present. When the lunar light is vivid, we see nothing except reflections of old patterns despite the beauty. So make them good old patterns. When the solar rays touch us, anything may come to be. All possibilities equalize and unfold, should we have the fortitude to allow. Spring is a very important time for the mystic. In its repeated cyclical manifestation, there's a great wisdom an enigmatic indication of higher teachings. How to live, how to renew, how to heal. When the wise woman begins to understand that the seasons map the intimacies of her own heart, all seasons are perfect and beautiful. To embrace another tide of fresh arrivals into the magical maelstrom of life is to already be observing the great black doorway where all forms meet their end, without which there could be no cultivation at all. What use is an entrance if you can never leave? The mystic makes a friend of the black doorway. Old, this. This is one of the root teachings. To know that the exit beckons the entrance. To perceive without trepidation that in the fleeting fictional blur of one life, especially your own, the infinite is always here. And it is all that is real. Phenomena arising, receding, pulsing is the dream. The sense of the divine feels like home. We don't want to dream forever. These Romecast recordings are tracking real-time reflections of thoughts and feelings from month to month and in any given moment. Nothing is static. Everything is in motion. Sometimes things are calm and gentle. And sometimes they are tempestuous and hard. In these monologues, where words are spoken and listened to and reflected upon, and we hear the water and the wind and the birds and people and motion... Life intersecting life. This is all an experiment. I am trying to articulate with sound a foundational mystical precept. And it is this. We cannot transcend what we have not understood. We cannot understand what we have not deconstructed. We cannot deconstruct what we have not perceived honestly. So this is what I'm doing in these recordings, articulating the first piece of this wisdom, perceiving honestly. To say what is, not what I would like to show you, all the best bits, but all of it. What is? 
So I describe what arises within me, as it arises, whatever its nature. I choose my words precisely, and consider the use of language to be very significant. So some observances are nicely structured and refined, and others are quite unruly and raw. The lovely often sits beside the coarse. And this is the test. To exhibit what is real, not what is imagined as an ideal, but what is real. To have one's own life as the canvas for growth. Not some mythology or story, but what is here. Your fingers, your socks, the lemon in the kitchen, the way you touch your bottom lip when you think, the manner in which you speak to your family. These things are the tests. Not sat on a mountain, not in a cave, not in the temple, but here in our life, in our capacity to love, in the way we speak to the lady in the post office. How do you behave? Do you act to look a certain way in front of people? Or do you act to be a certain way for yourself? And so there is a necessary poetry to this living philosophy that I share with you. It falls into aggression and shadow, just as it may rise into peace and light. The principle of polarity as a teaching mechanism is as old as can be, and we're impelled to be the pioneers and cartographers of this ebb and flow. And this is the trick, through mapping both poles of life experience, and only through that can we hope to find the point of equilibrium, and through so doing, collapse that polarity, and collapse it by knowing it, by knowing its essence, understanding that black is white and white is black. That old yin-yang symbol, so often used in spiritual circles, you know. The hint is in the dots, to say they are each other, the two aspects of one thing, and when you understand them fully, there is now no longer a need to roller coaster between pleasure and pain, hard and soft, black and white. There's a huge difference between having lots of knowledge about a thing and understanding a thing. We can know our faults and weaknesses, have great quantities of information about them and yet do absolutely nothing to change them just keep repeating the dramas and tragedies in a cheerless time loop true understanding comes only through embodiment to appreciate and familiarise oneself with the essence of something be it interior or exterior We have to allow it into our daily being to be as much a part of our life as the breath in our lungs. And this is why I permit myself to vent spleen. Just as much as I may resonate serenity and composure, they're both legitimate parts of my life. This is the only honest way. I've observed that the more truthfully I express myself, whatever the frequency of that feeling or deliberation, the more deeply I admit my raw impressions, the further I evolve. To know the four-way interplay of the reflex, the contemplation, the trigger, and the root of all experiences in life. This is the way of the mystic. To acknowledge that an entire life 
lived reflexively, that is, simply to find oneself responding to events, is a life of playing roulette. With no real consistency, no control, no self-mastery. The mystic first must acknowledge this in themselves to move beyond it. To just respond to happenings is no way to live. As an educator of contemporary mysticism, it is vital to have jurisdiction and command of oneself. It is a realisation that our feelings towards the world and the people and things and events within it will remain raw and childlike and untrue until we refine them. And in the normal course of mainstream life, no one ever shows us how. So the mystic becomes intimately acquainted with his emotional landscape. Emotional maturity is a fantastic marker for higher attainment. The universe has this incredible safeguard against dimwits laying their hands upon something that could be dangerous to themselves and others. And it's simple. Without a degree of self-mastery, you cannot know anything of the higher order. You have to get your own self together. Clean, strong, balanced first. There is no evolution without conscious work. Ideas of Darwinian evolution by natural selection and automated adaptation for survival are quite fallacious to many mystics. This is challenging and can understandably be framed as entirely contrary to the presiding scientific viewpoint, of course, and therefore comfortably classified as gibberish. Yet I am inclined to agree now that the only evolution is conscious evolution. When a system is evolving, there is a willful intelligence behind it, permeating it within it. Systems where there is no conscious effort and awareness, no will, no higher wisdom, be they men, these systems, or women, or flowers, or eagles, coral reefs, such systems will dissolve into the particulate recycling bin. All of their own accord. All by their own free will. Nothing can truly vanish. But its form and narrative and trajectory can be erased. So our guessing about the way things are must be founded in being. In heart and mind. When these are in balance, which they must be, one is no better than the other, high or low, then we can establish a channel to the higher will, and the guessing recedes, and something else is taking place. We allow the logos into our thinking. Loving the world and its things is a way of saying that by investing in the sensory, concrete phenomena of the world, we lead ourselves astray. We suppose the menu to be the food. If we do this, the homing signal, the higher divine knowingness, the encompassing wholeness of the original emanation, which is called the love of the Father, is absent. We're on our own. The lust of the flesh and of the eyes is referring to the overwhelming attachment we have for the physical and the visual, the sensation of life. We believe what we see is real, is it, all of it. And we intellectually know that this may not be the case, but we don't really know. The phenomenal world does have a kind of reality, but it's very thin. It's not it. One degree 
of one degree of one degree it is a projection the pride of life is the arrogant and self-centered assertion that we know what we're doing and we know what things are we don't our conceit in imagining we know what is what here distances us from the creator and the pristine nature of ultimate reality not of the father but of the world not the original merely a piece of theater so the world passes away and the lust with it the reality before us and our attachment to it will go away we can guarantee that can't we for each of us when we exit this is all gone for us and one day for everyone the entire solar system the entire galaxy changed gone he that doeth the will of god abideth forever he that embodies the knowing of his own life who cleans his mind to experience what is real allows the original creative signal or algorithm into himself and thereby transcends the changeable world he abides forever because his soul is not bound to what is temporary all forms can be transcended this is the natural way so there it is this spectacular wisdom this huge mystical clue on what not to do and how better to regard one's own life right there in the pages of a book that many have long since cast aside and i admit i too had laid the bible to rest for many a long year largely due to the deep ignorance of those who had shared it with me in my homeland who had taught it to me and like many of you it had left a nasty taste in my mouth it's for this reason really that buddhism has seen such an incredible resurgence in the west over the last century because frankly the surface messages in buddhism are more empowering to the individual you don't have to delve very deeply before you lay your hands upon some really useful material whereas the paltry exoteric interpretation of christian spiritual philosophy has little for the eager student all those silly ministers and pastors and priests and bishops and cardinals and vicars and pontiffs not all of them but most of them for all kinds of reasons have not been able to share the real wisdom of the last 2000 years encoded in their books throughout my mystical tutelage my teachers have never stopped talking about christ and god and all the associated symbolism and i thought why or oh why aren't we moving on from these things i couldn't understand it all those groups secret open mysterious plain they maintain the christ and the one god because they are relevant enriching and real not the personages of Jesus of Nazareth or angry demigod Jehovah something else today it could be helpful if we were in our mystical college which i hope to see as a reality one day if we were to speak of this we'd say well one way of reframing christ is in conceiving of the divine avatar the child of the universal creative intelligence an avatar that may be embodied by and in all of us the christ avatar frequency is a level of attainment it is a stage of initiation to the mystic this thinking is no problem at all makes sense we can speak of god as source god as oneness god as the emanation throughout the all or god as the pure origin he we'll call him for convenience is often described as unbegotten in more esoteric tracts because he never comes into being to have material or even astral presence no need so 
However you like to think of it, the further you go into the real mystical arcana of this stuff, the harder it is to deny the presence of God. He is here. And I have no problem using the word God. To have the hand of God with me in my times of pain or weakness is encouraging. Not the idea of it, the reality of it. Which can be felt if I sufficiently clarify my vessel to feel. To be able, even in the smallest way, to tune into this will of God is an extraordinary privilege that is open to us all in all moments now if you take the traditional exoteric that is the outer surface view of Christianity the will of God might be mistaken as some commandments of religious piety and subservient worship or some such thing. But it is nothing of the sort. The original emanation, that which informs the evolution of all forms and patterns in the universe, this is the will of God. The universe is a work in progress. It is not finished. It is evolving. And when it notices that we are consciously evolving, it becomes our ally. It guides and protects, if we let it. It can explain anything, heal anything, manifest anything. The daily practice of the mystic is concerned with unfolding pure consent within oneself to let this happen. So if you didn't know... Please consider that when you hear of the love of God and the will of God and the hand of God, these things refer to profound principles that can show us something exquisite. A wise old English teacher impressed a very luminous piece of guidance upon my 14-year-old mind. She told me this, If you want to speak well, you need to write well. And to write well, you need to read well. Mrs Cooper then went on to explain what she meant by read well. Because you might fairly say that, well, that's surely a very relative thing, very subjective what constitutes reading well 
For me, might not for you, and for you, might not for me. But no, not at all. She was quite resolute in asserting that there's a certain amount of classical, quality, literature that must be absorbed before any sort of good writing or eloquent speech can come into play. She felt that, for the Western-inclined sensibilities at least, there existed 100 books displaying great style and content and invention. And once imbibed, as it were, these works would stay with the student forever. You can tell when you're reading something that was inspired by a higher power. You can smell good writing, like freshly baked bread or fresh ground coffee. You can smell it. Everyone knows it. It's a good smell, and most people from most walks of life will agree upon it. Not all, but most. It's universal enough. It's true enough, as Wittgenstein used to say. To share in a beautiful language that tells of powerful, cosmic feelings and previously ineffable thoughts is one of the little beautiful exercises in life that we can all participate in. Can you join in this great shared communication? Can you add your own delicious and singular imagination to the reading and writing and speaking of our people? Or are you content not to? You don't have to. You don't need to do diddly squat if you don't want. But from Mrs Cooper's point of view, bless her, every student who did read those 100 books, from one educator's standpoint, they would each then possess a decent experience of having read well. And make of that what you will, but she felt that they would then be more inclined to have a go at writing themselves, and as she would hope, to write well. And then, having learned to marshal a strong set of language skills, the student would then be in a better position to speak well, off the cuff, spontaneously, to riff and jam and expound, whether casually, like this, or even more informally, just amongst friends, just chatting, or in a much more formal capacity, as in a lecture or a seminar. All really interesting ways of communicating that we can become adept in if we want. So if I was listening to this, I'd think, yeah, okay, about these hundred books, what hundred books? Can't remember all of them, but I can remember some, or at least the authors, and you can fill in the blanks yourself, because you'll get the general idea... Nabokov, Kafka, Hess, Orwell, Shakespeare, Alighieri, Twain, Nietzsche, Tolkien, Salinger, Joyce, Swift, Conan Doyle, you get the picture. So 27 years on from that time, I think Mrs Cooper had something. It was clever, maybe shrewd and cunning, just to get the student off their bottom and doing something, thinking, feeling, creating. It's good for us to take in the words of those who have irrefutably evoked the unspoken inner dialogue of the true-hearted human, to say out loud what was only previously thought privately, and thereby succeeding in transcribing this intimate consciousness that passes through all of our minds and render it into a sequence of vivid, familiar words that we can share. Isn't it nice and reassuring when someone expresses the inexpressible? And you know then that you're not alone in all this craziness. All those cherished and ephemeral ideas and recollections and hopes that even we ourselves, to ourselves can scarcely enunciate to have those tenderly and deftly set down in this distinctive poetry of English 
quiet, transient dreams of yearning, opulent fantasies, and half-forgotten sentimental ponderings. No dry eyes, no closed lips. Just listening and waiting. The many instances of entrance and exit in life. The new arrive, the old depart. All the little things we do in our days. All essentially the same for all of us. And there is some talented writer helping us to chronicle our shared dream. To know that there is an underlying togetherness, even though it seems to elude us most of the time. Some literature, whether on the page or the screen or through your headphones, deserves to be properly absorbed in the right environment. For many years, a good friend of mine would come across various interesting books throughout the year and would very rarely read them at the time of acquisition. She would wait for the right moment and situation to read each book. It was a strange and mysterious art she practised. It was as if each book had its own optimal time window and conducive setting. So these books would collect in corners and shelves of her home and they'd sit there for weeks or months or years, easily. And then, one day, the day would come. The day and mood and temperament for one of the books would arrive. And she'd take the book in question, recline in some especially comfortable chair, by a window, with the rain falling outside on some indistinct afternoon, and then she would give herself to the text. She would merge with the visions of some other soulful human. Slang has always fascinated me. It has within it a sort of encoded provincial social commentary. It tells us things about the way people think and feel. The words themselves reflect certain sentiments and local perceptions, right or wrong, good or bad. In England we have a particularly rich lexicon of slang. Thousands of amazing words from all different counties across the land and And we have this other lovely thing in England called Cockney Rhyming Slang that derives from working class areas of East London where certain words are replaced by words or phrases that rhyme with them. And just to make it more confusing to the untrained ear, you usually only hear the first part of that rhyme, the bit that often doesn't rhyme. So for years I've always said, let's have a butcher's at it then. Which means let's have a look at it then. Butcher's hook, look. Or I'll say, I better go and get a new whistle for that wedding that I'm going to. A new suit, that is. A whistle and flute. So flute's the rhyme. Whistle and flute is the full rhyme. But you only say the first part, so you call a suit a whistle. So obviously to those who don't know, (laughs) they don't know what the hell you're talking about. All the twists and turns and detours and minor roads of language and try and communicate things so we can know ourselves and each other in the best possible way. And choosing to live in America, I have learned all sorts of new words, some legit and some slang. And it's funny to me how these things, these very resonant words, in just everyday life circumstances have totally different meanings compared to all the things that I grew up with for most of my life. And every week or so, we, my wife and I find a new one that we didn't really know about. So it's humorous, yeah, but it's also very educational to me to explore and share these verbal and written symbols that we use to not only communicate, but think in as well. We think in language. You try thinking about something without language, 
In normal states of consciousness, it's very difficult. You have to train the mind to think outside of language. Go on a 10-day silent Vipassana retreat and you'll learn how that works. So Mrs. Kramer and her sisters, who are just all brilliant, by the way, all of them, they have this kind of food that they make when they gather together, when they meet with each other. And this food is called Abel Skeevers. Another brilliant, brilliant word, Abel Skeevers. Do you know what that is? It's a traditional Danish dish, essentially pancakes made into little solid spheres. And you cook them in a special pan sometimes with hemispherical indentations for each of these little balls. And you stuff them with things like cheese or chocolate, these little pancake balls, and then dip them into lingonberry sauce. And they're absolutely delicious. And I knew nothing of this caper before coming here. As I say, it's a Danish tradition because my wife and her sisters are all originally from Denmark. They're all American now, through and through, but with these lovely, striking Nordic features, beautiful warrior princesses who cook world-class able skeevers. You know, what more could a man ask? Silly. I'm a bit suspect, I think. You never know to what extent you influence other people in the world. For many years I worked in the world of software and computers and technology. I was a relatively young man and doing well, as they say. It all looked good on paper. It wasn't a bad job and I chose it and it was more agreeable than what a lot of people had to do to pay the bills I noticed. And I prided myself in doing a good job. I always do, whatever it is. Well, if I'm going to do this, I might as well do a decent job of it. Make it good, solid. My bosses and colleagues knew that in the normal course of events, I did a great job. They could trust me and rely on me. But nevertheless, with every passing day, I could not help but observe that in myself, my heart wasn't in it. I was just showing up and I was suppressing this observance on a regular basis. As we all do at one time or another. And I convinced myself that we all have to do something that probably isn't what you really want to do. And when we look around, sure enough, most people are doing some rubbish thing that they don't really like. My job wasn't rubbish was okay, and the people I worked with were alright. Some really good lads, talented, funny, interesting. Yet still, I didn't really want to do it. didn't really want to be there. It wasn't fulfilling me. If I was honest with myself, too much of my time and energy was being poured into this career. Whatever we're doing, with even the vaguest glimmer of consciousness, that is enough to be always learning about the world and people and oneself. Even if we know that we're embroiled in some lacklustre, self-appointed incarceration, even then, there's always growth inching forward. But I knew that I couldn't express myself fully or even begin to realise a small percentage 
of my potential while I was in this job. I couldn't give air to the fire, as the druids used to say. So I hid inside a little cover story of my own fabrication. I was doing okay. I was in a decent job and should think myself darn well lucky. It could be worse. Better the devil you know. And so it went on for many years. Then one day, I think it was in Cumbria somewhere during the summer, my girlfriend and I were driving along the country lanes and visiting quaint old towns and having tea and scones and all that. Very nice it was. I like that kind of thing. Some men don't like that, do they? But I do. And we came upon this old-fashioned little village. The sort where they preserve their heritage very carefully and with great pride and give talks about the history and demonstrations of old trades and crafts which are disappearing now, really. And in one corner of this village, near a river, was a blacksmith, a potter, and a glass blower. These men and women demonstrating old arts and crafts and showing us how to make beautiful things from metal and clay and glass. And I was drawn to the glass blower on this day and I watched him. I regarded him with a very keen eye for some reason. I observed him as deeply on that day as I have ever observed anyone, ever. I was just stood there among a little group of onlookers, quite unobtrusive, you know. But I looked deeply at the scene before me. Like sometimes you do out at a landscape and you kind of merge with it for a brief time. You go outside yourself and your woes and particulars evaporate for a minute and you're just there, pure, open. And so it was in this frame of mind that I watched this man. I watched him manipulating a glowing orange molten blob of glass on the end of a long metal blowpipe. And he was shaping this molten glass against a special anvil thing and using some custom tools to extrude and sculpt the liquid glass. And I knew he was fulfilling himself, working mindfully with these elements happy creative and there was a smile on his face I seem to remember but more so he had this quality of being this kind hearted human presence full of dignity and character there he was this 35 year old in his dark blue overalls dirty involved comfortable inspired and though he was doing his job and entertaining the tourists, he was doing what he wanted to do. It was written through him, in his bones. Doing something wonderful. And his heart and his mind were in perfect balance. And his life, and his deeds, and his dreams were good. I saw his wife, his children, his hearth and home. I saw him in these moments. I felt his pure presence and it changed me. I could no longer lie to myself about my job and my life. Even though I'd just been promoted, I knew I had to express my truth follow the old dangerous pathways of unfoldment of the mysterious of the sacred and all of this now devalued and forgotten in the modern world but this didn't bother me in fact it makes it more interesting doesn't it 
So I determined right there that I was going to dedicate my life to something real for me. No one else, me. And the only real thing for me is growth, to be a better person, to be a more natural person, a full human being, that's all. So an apparently chance encounter with this man, this glass blower, who was a perfect stranger to me, had a profound influence on my life. His quality of being was impeccable. And I knew in that terrible and striking moment that I had to go back and change. I changed everything. My entire life changed. And I did my level best to be as peaceful and light-footed as possible in these times of transition. I did not want to incur any injury or loss anywhere to anyone. But I did what I needed to do. And life got better. Real fulfilment came. And my conduct and humour and warmth increased. I became a better person. It was one of the most important days of my life. Being in the presence of this man. A pivotal encounter with a stranger who had no idea that he had changed my life and had encouraged me to follow a path of living spiritual philosophy. Perhaps he changed other people's lives too. Maybe he even knew about it. Maybe he was a secret chief, a higher master, a visitor. Maybe just a man. Maybe just a glass blower. Whichever way it was, I glimpsed a truth about life through his natural being. Through his equilibrium. We just don't know how our being is perceived by others. I observed in a large store the other day a young mother speaking with her seven or eight year old daughter. And the mother looked rough, to be honest with you. And I dare say, uneducated. But the quality of her dialogue with her daughter was first class. Really something. And the way in which the daughter spoke with her mother was excellent. The words they used, the eye contact they had with each other, the observances they shared together as they walked through the store, the body language, and an unspoken understanding that they'd already established, you could see it and feel it. They had a great relationship together. Much better than many posh, wealthy, upper middle class, educated parents will ever achieve with their children. I've seen it a million times. When a parent has a good relationship with the kids, it's just the best thing ever. And what was even better in this instance was that another young mother who was with her son, who was still very, very young, was watching and listening to this super mum. And I felt she was reflecting upon it and making mental notes. Perhaps she was thinking as she observed this mother and daughter together, that's good. That is the way in which I would like to communicate with my son. To be friends. To have faith in each other. So again, a young mum just going about a business, but quietly changing lives around her. She would never have guessed it, never in a million years. The youthful mystic is taught to teach by example, not just words, 
not just intentions, but by what you do and how you do it. Work on the quality of your own being. And know that once it reaches a certain threshold, it'll serve as a beacon for others. Other people around you, who you walk past in everyday life, in the most unexpected and unglamorous of places. We all support and inspire our fellow human adventurers in how to be. And only through this pioneering, smooth, deep being do we find the level of fulfilment that we've always wished for. Thank you.